this time, Your Honor, uh, defense calls Peter J. Stevens, M.D. Uh, he's having, having been first duly sworn and examined for testifying. Good afternoon, Dr. Stevens. We appreciate your coming down from Mount Air to be with us here in Asheville. Would you state your full name, please, and spell it? Yes, sir. It is Peter John Stevens, P-E-T-E-R-J-O-H-N-S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. It is 100 Club Drive, Suite 135, Burnsville, North Carolina, 28714. Where do you come from originally? Originally, until I finished high school, I was brought up and raised in the United Kingdom, mostly in and around London. At the age of 16, I moved to Montreal, Canada, and spent the next 10 years there going to college and medical school. Hold on just a second while the judge gets the... All right, sir, would you give us your college and medical training background, and then I'll ask you a little bit about some of your experience. Yes, in 1957, I entered the Faculty of Science at McGill, M-C-G-I-L-L, -L, University in Montreal, Canada, and graduated with a degree of Bachelor of Science in May of 1961. In the fall of 1961, I entered the medical faculty of the same university and graduated from McGill in May of 1965 with a degree of Doctor of Medicine. After that, I did a year of rotating internship in all of the clinical specialties at McGill Hospital, McGill Teaching Hospital in Montreal, after which I did two years of pathology residency at the Medical College of Virginia and two additional years of pathology residency at the University of Western Ontario in London, Canada. After that, did you enter into the practice of pathology? Yes, I did. Okay, and how long have you been a practicing pathologist? From 1970, when I passed my board certification examinations through 1977, I practiced in Battle Creek, Michigan. From 1977 through 2001, I practiced in the state of Iowa and Davenport, Iowa, and in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and then I tried to retire. Yes, sir. Now, you're still working as a consulting pathologist, is that correct? Yes, I am. You use the term, we use the term forensic pathology. How long have you been involved in the field of forensic pathology, doctor? Well, I had been involved in the field of forensic pathology really throughout my training because the Medical College Virginia Autopsy Room was shared between the university and the medical examiner's office of the state of Virginia at the time. I'm sorry, the Commonwealth of Virginia at that time. And my chief in Canada was also a forensic pathologist and worked for the Ontario government. So right through my training I received a lot of forensic pathology exposure. When I went into practice right from day one, the practices I worked through all th I worked through all through my career were involved in acting as consultant to the medical examiners of various countries in and around the Midwest. In 1984 I decided that I would like to get myself board certified in forensic pathology because relatively few people have done that and certainly none in the immediate area that I was practicing in. So I took the examination for certification in forensic pathology in 1984 and passed and have been board certified in forensic pathology since then. Have you participated since 1984 as a teacher or instructor in seminars or classes? Yes, I have, both for medical technologists and law enforcement personnel and also for attorneys. Okay. How many times have you testified in criminal trials, approximately? I have a very hard time estimating that, but I would say somewhere between 200 and 400. And have you also testified for the defense in cases? Yes, I have. Okay. When you are called upon as a consultant, do you consult these days both for law enforcement and for the defense? Typically these days it's virtually 100% for the defense, the reason being that law enforcement now have the county attorneys and county solicitors and DAs, whatever you'd like to call them, and various jurisdictions have their own consultants in the form of county medical examiners or the state medical examiners. So they don't need to go out of that orbit to consult with me so that the defense attorneys on the other hand have nobody in that position and so they do call me. And you're obviously been qualified as an expert witness in forensic pathology at least 200 and possibly 400 times? Yes, including in the state of South Carolina. And that, that's, a, that's probably my question. I have no other questions. Solicitor, do you have some questions for the doctor? Please, if you don't mind, Dr. Stevens, it's nice to talk with you. Have you done any studying in the field of forensic pathology 
as would associate with what we consider cold cases or situations where you have not had a chance to actually examine the body. Excuse me, it's, it's nice to talk to you, sir. Yes, in most of the cases in which I work for the defense, for example, I have not had a chance to examine the body because the body has usually been autopsied by somebody else and has then been long dead and buried by the time the defense attorney gets around to calling me. So in that sense, virtually all of the cases I've done for the last 12 years have been cold cases with one autopsy examination accepted. Otherwise, in terms of what is a cold case, that that's way old like this. I have only handled one, which was an exhumation autopsy in a body that had been underground for 35 years. All right, sir. Now let me ask you this. The body of your experience, how much would it have involved aut autopsy operations? I've done about 3,000 autopsies during my lifetime. I don't keep detailed records, but my best estimate is somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000. And were most of those done in Canada? No. Only the Canadian ones would be a small minimum, probably a couple of hundred. Most of them were done either in Richmond when I was training down there or in the various counties of the Midwest where I've been acted as a consultant to the medical examiners in those counties. All right. I don't think I have any other questions about your qualifications. Thank you very much, and I have no objection. Move he be admitted as an expert, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, sir. The forensic pathology. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to move right to this case. This is the state of South Carolina versus George Stinney, Jr. And as you know, it's a 1944 case. The first thing we want to talk about is the report of Dr. A.C. Bazard. And we had discussed when we were preparing for this testimony that you do not feel like this should be designated as an autopsy. Can you explain that, please? An autopsy report typically runs several pages. You can argue about how long and how many pages it should be. But as long as the facts are there and are documented, then you know in some cases as little as one or two pages will work. In more complicated cases, such as the present one, typically they'll run four to six pages. So in that sense, the length and the detail of these so-called autopsy reports is significant. The main reason why I don't consider these to represent true autopsy reports is that there is no record in the report that was filed by Drs. Bizarre and Baker to suggest that a dissection had been done of the inside of the skull or of the inside of the rest of the body. There is essentially no way in which you can tell whether anybody picked up a knife and actually made some dissections and examined the internal surfaces of the body, which form a critical part of the most modern autopsies. What this would be considered today, and we still do this kind of autopsy today in cases that don't involve assaults like this one, but what we do do today is what's called an external examination, and that is basically an examination of the external surfaces of the body looking for bruises or fractures or anything obvious or additional holes like gunshot wounds that ought not to be there. And if the body looks otherwise healthy and normal, they will be signed out by the medical examiner on the basis of the external examination and without doing a full formal autopsy, looking at the inside of the body. And can you answer me more slowly? In this situation then, we will call it, if you will, an external examination, and we will focus um, first on Betty June Vinegar. This examination was done by Dr. A.C. Bazard, who is a family practitioner in Manning and Clarendon County. Do you feel that there was an ambit of thoroughness about the external examination that he did? It's very difficult for me to comment on the quality of the external examination that's done by a non-forensic pathologist or a non-general pathologist even, because some general pathologists or hospital pathologists know a fair amount of forensic pathology and do a detailed external examination but this would appear to be the record of a typical family doctor who is unused to doing autopsies, that is, is unused to examining bodies after death and is untrained in trauma pathology. That said, it's not a bad examination for somebody with that kind of limited education, training, and experience. When you do an external examination, it is critical to report, identify the bruising, abrasions, and all of the things that you see on the skin, the hair, the hands, and that's what you're really looking for. That's the total focus of this exam. Is that correct? That is correct. And also, such bruises and defects and tears would be ordinarily documented as to their length and configuration, at least in the written report, supplemented by either sketches or photographs. And in this report, as we had discussed, it indicates that the hymen of both of these girls, Betty June included, were, we're talking about, was intact. Is that right? That's correct. 
now we will get to some testimony about uh, these in just a few minutes, but I'd like to get your opinion as to looking at this document, um, be it many, many years old, telling us, in your opinion, what happened to Betty Jean Benneker and Mary Emma Thames that caused their death. Well, both of these children clearly died as a result of blunt force injury to the head, which is the term that we would use nowadays and probably was used in some quarters even back in 1944. The written report of Drs. Bizarre and Baker certainly documents ample reason to believe that this is what happened. There is extensive bruising around the top of the head in both. There is laceration and crushed bones are recorded. So clearly the cause of death in both cases is a blunt force injury to the head. In such situations, the differential diagnosis always involves natural death, which this obviously isn't because it's not natural death, accident, suicide, and homicide. Well, accident typically requires some demonstration of some mechanism by which the accident could have occurred, and these are unusual injuries to be sustained in an accident, so I think you could exclude accidental. You can certainly exclude suicide because it would be virtually impossible for somebody to self-inflict these injuries, so we're left with the manner of death as being clearly homicidal. The indication that Dr. Bazard had as to the weapon that would inflict such damage can you talk to us about your opinion of that observation and give us, in your experience, how these injuries could have been inflicted? Well, I recognize that, as I mentioned, Dr. Bizarre's limited education, training, and experience in forensic pathology. Nowadays, we, were, we would require considerably more information to be able to make a determination on what weapon might have been used to inflict these injuries. For example, we would certainly want measurements done of the defects and of the tears. We would also ideally want either good sketches or photographs, and in this day and age, virtually every autopsy of a case like this involves photographs of the fractures and the tears in the scalp, and also any bleeding or bruising surrounding those tears and fractures. So I cannot state to any reasonable degree of medical certainty what the weapon that was used was. However, Dr. Bizarre expresses in the opinion that it was a, quote, small round head about the size of a hammer. Well, I'm going to assume that anybody, any adult living in South Carolina at the time, would have known roughly what the size of a hammer was. And so if you felt that this was consistent with a hammer, I would say that that's about as close as you can get. And, and what about the conclusion by the police that George Stenny Jr. confessed to killing these children with a railroad spike of various descriptions? I think it would be very unusual for a railroad spike to inflict these kind of injuries. The railroad spikes that I'm familiar with usually have a rectangular cross-section throughout most of the spike, and the expanded end of the railroad spike, the head of the spike, if you will, is not small, and I don't think it would be confused by Dr. Bizarre or anybody else with the head of a hammer. Furthermore, it would not give you a, quote, punched-out lesion, which is what he describes. It would give you much more crushing around the, the edge of the lesion, and I don't know, I don't think it would be easily mistaken for a hammer blow. So I'm comfortable in going with Dr. Bizarre's opinion that this is a hammer. Well then, your testimony would be, am I not correct, that you would rule out a description that would include a railroad spike of any nature? I think a railroad spike can be systematically excluded in this, yes, by virtue of the reason I've given you, and in addition to which a railroad spike could be used to inflict injury in a couple of different ways. Firstly, the smaller end, the tapered end of the railroad spike, could be held in the hand, and then the larger end brought down with violence on the side of the head or on the top of the head. This would give a totally different configuration to the fractures than a punched out fracture. The only way that a punched out fracture could be given would be to grasp the length of the spike in one hand and then bring down the pointed end of the spike, which as I've said, doesn't fit because it's rectangular, but the only way that you could create a punched out lesion with a railroad spike is by grasping the railroad spike itself and bringing it down near vertically on the skull and that would give a punched out lesion. But it should be rectangular rather than round. I think that's a case of something that could be demonstrated better with a railroad spike in one's hand than without. Yes, sir. There was another description of a murder weapon as a piece of blunt iron or an iron rod. Do you find the findings of Dr. Bizarre consistent with an iron rod or a piece of blunt iron? 
I would have to see the piece of blunt iron and the iron rod. Some iron rods I could conceive of it happening, but again, it would have have to be held clenched around the hand and then the circular end of the rod, so to speak, brought down on the head, and that doesn't strike me as being an intuitive way of inflicting damage with a rod. All right. If you would continue then. There is nothing in the external examination report <coughs> to suggest that defensive wounds of any kind were present, although that's assuming that Dr. Bizard would have recognized a defensive type wound. But the lack of bruises elsewhere on the body suggests that these people were not defending themselves at all, and there is basically only one explanation for that, and that is that they were incapacitated in some way, shape, or form, such as by drugs or alcohol or retardation, and I don't see that that's in the material that I've been given. Absent those kind of explanations, I would expect to see some kind of defensive wounds and bruises, especially if the victims were evenly matched with the assailant. So the absence of such wounds suggests to me that the assailant was a larger assailant with overpowering size and force. Okay, thank you, sir. So let's talk about the scene where they were found. Can you give us some observations <laughs> in your mind about the lack of photography, the nature and description of the scene? Well, firstly, the scene investigation is of paramount importance to any forensic pathologist and that the circumstances and the location in which the body is found and in which the body has died, was killed, those two are not always the same, are critically important. Nowadays, and even back in the period of this trial, photography was used extensively. Nowadays, we use typically, routinely use color photography. In those days, black and white photography was widely used and when done properly is just as good. The absence of photographs of the scene is concerning to me because it means that I cannot really make any comments about the scene other than what's possible. The absence of photographs of the body is even more concerning to me because there is no documentation that might give us further information on the nature of these wounds. And in those days, you know, black and white cameras were pretty sophisticated. Well, we have a description and evidence that was newly discovered from one Francis Bacon, who was about 15 years old at the time, Batson, who was about 15 years old at the time. His affidavit indicates that he was one of four people who found these bodies early in the morning after they went missing. He says that the bodies were found in a ditch area. They were, about, they were in about three inches of water, laying on their backs, and a bicycle on top of them. He indicates that he did not recall a significant amount of blood anywhere around the area. I would ask you, whether or not you would comment on whether you would expect this type of attack, this type of injury inflicted upon the skull and the scalp area to produce a significant amount of bleeding. I would. Scalp lacerations are classically and characteristically very, very bloody. The soft tissues of the scalp, there's a lot of blood vessels in the scalp, which is one of the reasons, frankly, why on a cold day like today people wear hats because the hat keeps the the heat from leaving these blood vessels through the skin and getting out into the open air so that the scalp soft tissues are extremely vascular as we say V-A-S-C-U-L-A-R as the technical term for it which means there's just a lot of blood vessels both arteries and veins running all around the soft tissues of the scalp beneath the hair. When there is a laceration or especially if there is enough laceration to cause fragmentation of the underlying bone these are going to bleed profusely, and so it would be inconceivable that there was no blood around if this area was the scene of death. Somewhere where these two children were killed, there was clearly blood that may have been cleaned up or it may just not have been found and missed. Well, what about then if the assailant was close enough to produce multiple blows on both these children's skulls? The probability that his clothing would have blood on it. It would have been unusual to say the least if there had been no sign of blood anywhere on the clothing of an assailant wielding either a hammer or any other weapon short of like an eight foot pole that to get up close and personal to give this kind of an injury with blunt force, this type of blunt force injury with a defined object would be without getting any blood on you would be almost inconceivable because there is classically a lot of what is known to the blood specialist as cast off blood that would be expected to land somewhere on his clothes. Let's skip over to page 22, um, line 10. Let's talk about the testimony at trial of Dr. Baker regarding the possibility of sexual assault and a statement given by police to the governor of South Carolina 
attributing in the governor's letter you have reviewed that there was sexual assault on Ms. Benneker. Based on doc, upon Dr. Bazard's examination, do you have an opinion as to whether or not there was sexual assault or significant evidence of an attempt at sexual assault? Yeah, I don't see any evidence of sexual assault or of attempted sexual assault. The only thing that would remotely suggest that possibility, and forensic pathologists typically need to evaluate possible suggestions and possibilities, is the report of a, quote, slight bruise, close quotes, present on the right side of the genitalia. Both hymens were intact and both children. No other bruises were present on Betty June's body. And this is far from enough. This is far from enough evidence to imply that any kind of sexual assault or attempted assault occurred, especially in a girl who we can presume did a fair amount of bicycle riding. This could have been chafing or the effects of a fall onto the saddle. There's a number of possible explanations. The next testimony regarding the alleged confessions that would have been addressed at the trial was that Dr. Baker testified that one of the reasons he could not determine sexual assault was that the children had been submerged in water overnight. Would you comment on that testimony? Well, yeah, this gets us back into, or this gets us into the area of post-mortem changes in bodies. And I think that we all understand that bodies undergo considerable change after death. And neither Dr. Bizarre nor Dr. Baker, as far as I know, have had any specific education, training, or experience in evaluating these changes. The statement that simply because the body was in water, and I understand that the body wasn't totally immersed in water, it was basically in a shallow depth of water, I don't think would have any influence on the ability to determine whether or not there was sexual assault there. Then the controlling issue would have been both girls hymen intact and no significant or substantial bruising in that area? In the absence of an internal dissection, yes, that would be the presence of intact hymens with no bruising immediately around the hymen and would be strongly suggestive that no sexual assault had ever taken place. Let's skip over then, am I correct, solicitor, to page 26, line 10? That's correct. Then your opinion is also based on the fact that Dr. Bazard's medical report, his external, external examination, did not indicate any evidence of defensive wounds. No, it didn't. There was no record in either body of any bruising being on any of the extremities, and typically that the arms and the legs and the hands and the feet or will you, where you will find defensive wounds. If a person, a victim, is lying on the ground on their back, they can kick and they will kick, and the kicking may cause bruises on the legs. More commonly, everybody is standing up or in a more or less upright position, and the bruising is going to be on the arms and the hands. But the absence of any bruising elsewhere on the body suggests to me that this was a very targeted assault on the head. The accounts of the confessions, the alleged confessions, and the account of the coroner's, of, at the coroner's inquest indicated that a young man, five feet one, 95 pounds, dragged at least Ms. Benneker in one account some distance. Whether it had been 10 yards or 50 yards, we don't know. In your examination of this external evaluation by Dr. Bazard, was there any evidence that Betty June Benneker had been dragged at all? No, there was not. Is there any evidence that the young Thames girl had been dragged at all? The only thing there is that there is a reference to, quote, brush wound, close quotes, which I assume is a scrape on the forehead. That by itself is not evidence of a dragging situation. In evaluating dragging, what's important as much as anything is the examination of the surface on which they were believed to have been dragged. Were they dragged across grass? Were they dragged across concrete? Or were they dragged across just plain soil? And so I don't see any evidence to make me believe from these external examinations that there was any evidence of dragging. The description that was given by the authorities was there were briars and bushes and brush around this ditch. Unfortunately, another defect of the external examination is that doctors Bazard and Baker did not discuss what kind of clothing they took off these two children and there is no dissection or no record that briars were caught in the hair or anything like that. So that is, I think, is negative evidence of dragging or them being found. I was about to ask you that, excuse me. I was about to ask you about the hair because it would seem in this situation that the dragging would not have been by the head or the hair, 
or the doctors would have seen the lack of hair or hair pulled out. That's one part of it. The other part is the dragging would be most, dragging of these two bodies would be most conveniently done by picking them up, by lifting them by the feet and dragging them. If you were evenly matched, you know it's equally possible that they could have been picked up by the arms and dragged some, but then there should be some scuff marks on the feet and maybe the feet were examined and maybe they weren't. But there's no record of any scuff marks on the feet. And again, if they had been picked up by the arms and dragged by the feet, that would not explain any abrasion. It would not relate to any abrasion on the forehead, but it would be expected to leave gouge marks in the soil or the grass on which they were dragged, assuming that they were not dragged across concrete. Yes, sir. So to conclude your testimony on our portion, you've written an opinion that excludes within a reasonable degree of medical certainty a railroad spike of any description. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you also exclude the hypothesis that these children were dragged anywhere. Yes, I do. And you exclude the hypothesis, the hypothesis that either one of these girls was sexually assaulted or that there was any attempt to sexually assault them. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. I have nothing else. Dr. Stevens, let me ask you a few questions, please, sir. Sure, sir. All right. What is the nature of your connection with Mr. Chandler and his law firm? Are you being paid? No. As a matter of fact, I have offered to do this pro bono, and about 40% of my practice right now ends up being pro bono, either voluntarily or involuntary, involuntarily. And this I made voluntarily pro bono. I've had previous dealings with Mr. Chandler over the last 12 years, and I can't remember which case was when, but I think he's called me on two, maybe three cases max. I believe it's more likely two, one of which was an adult and another of which was an infant, and neither of them did I do even so much as a deposition in them. I think I basically gave them a verbal report over the phone and maybe your written report. I don't have any rec recollection of that. Well, let me just, as a follow-up, ask you, have you ever testified for Mr. Chandler or his law firm before in court? No, I have not. All right. Let me take you to the report of Dr. Bazard. And because the trial that we are talking about only has to do with Ms. Binnaker, I'm going to limit my questions to that issue. Right. Ms. Binnaker was the older of the two young ladies. And I think we can assume that she was the bigger of the two young ladies. Are you able to testify and give an opinion as to whether or not she was struck in the front or the back of her skull, and whether or not she was more likely facing or not facing her attack? That's a very good question, and I cannot. I think that to me, the lack of an attempt at self-defense indicates that she was not expecting whatever happened to her. So that the attack was probably from the rear, but I can't be totally sure of that. And if she was attacked from the rear and not expecting it, would that strengthen the reason why you did not find or read about physicals on her body? That's correct. It says here on the report that some of these have cracked the skull, while two have punched definitive holes in the skull. The back of the skull is nothing but a mass of crushed bones. That's correct. So that the attack was significant, and it was at least described here as at least seven blows on the head. That's correct. But having said that, that is Dr. Bizard's opinion, and it is very difficult at times to determine how many blows occurred. And I think that even today, a lot of pathologists tend to go a little bit overboard in evaluating their ability to tell how many blows happen. So with that proviso, that seven blows, since we don't have any photographs available, that can be, cannot be documented and confirmed. All right. Because of the type of description of the skull being a mass of crushed bones, would you agree that it would not be ordinarily easy or even probable that you could determine what type of instrument caused that type of trauma? As far as the back is concerned, yes. But some of them are reported to be punched, def definite, holes in the skull and it was in his opinion that they appeared to have been made by a blunt instrument with a small round head about the size of a hammer. That could very well, that is the best evidence we have as to the size of the weapon that inflicted these injuries. Once you get the fragmentation that's reported in the back of the skull, that makes things much more complicated because either multiple blows with that same instrument in the same area could have caused the fragmentation of the bone or also so also could a fall on the back of the head. If the assault had come from the front, a fall on the back of the head would have also caused similar fragmentation. 
if the fall was onto a hard surface such as O concrete or even a railroad tie. All right. Now let's talk about the railroad tie. If you had not seen a piece of evidence used by the solicitor in prosecuting this case, and there have been various descriptions, iron rod, iron pipe, you are not able to determine to a reasonable degree of medical certainty what instrument was used to cause the injuries to the girls. Yes, my basis for excluding the railroad spike is firstly, I understand that there are railroad spikes of varying size and configuration, and that said, the main reason is Dr. Bazard's impression that this was a hammer. All right, sir, but let me go back a little bit with you. Dr. Bazard saw the bodies of these little girls probably a day or so after they were discovered in the ditch. That's correct. And I don't know if you know this, but he was actually, it does say on his letterhead at the top of his report that his office was in man. Uh -huh. But there's nothing in the report referring to him being told that a spike was found or used on these girls. Is that correct? I don't know that for sure, but I can certainly believe it because typically even today pathologists doing autopsies on victims of all kinds are not given some of the definite, definitive evidence that they need until they ask for it. And I don't think, and it probably wouldn't have occurred to Dr. Bazard to have asked the law enforcement personnel at the scene whether there was anything else that they found that could have possibly done it. page 36 at the bottom. And what I'm asking you, sir, in your medical experience, without knowing what precise instrument was used by the killer, can you say that an iron rod or an iron pipe of some configuration other than a hammer could have caused these injuries? Yes, an object with a cylindrical or a round cross-section about the size of a hammer could have caused these injuries, certainly. All right, sir, let me ask you another question. You said that it's possible that the evidence showed that the girls may have been overpowered by a larger subject. Yes, sir. One of the possibilities, and I'm asking you, is, is it not also a possibility, based on the conversation I think we just had, is that these girls weren't expecting this attack, and that they therefore, that the element of surprise would have aided the person who was doing the attack. If the element of surprise aided the person who was doing the attack, then it could have been done by somebody of like size to the little girl. I need to object to the form of the question. The standard of testimony is not possibility, it's probability. I will accept that amendment, doctor. I will accept that anything is possible. But as far as probability is concerned, if you've got two people in the area and one has snuck up behind and assaulted, that will alter the behavior of the other person in the area and and well, doctor, you're assuming that they're together. What if the two little girls were picking flowers and they had drifted apart from each other? Well, as I said, anything is possible. Page 40, line 14. I'm asking questions to see if the doctor would agree that if the girls were snuck up on and the girls were not protecting each other at the time of the attack, whether or not they could have been injured in the manner to which Dr. Bazard expressed. Hypothetically, if that happened, yes, anything is possible. All right. It would depend on how far apart they drifted, so hypothetically anything is possible given a changing set of circumstances. Very good. I thank you for your answer, sir. Obviously, you have said that if you had had sketches, if you had had photographs, or if you had had measurements taken, it would have assisted you in analyzing the injuries that were sustained. <coughs> yes, and it would have raised my level of certainty of my understanding of it too. All right. The fact that those items are missing from the investigation <coughs> file leads you to have less evidence or less information to work with in coming to your conclusions and opinions. I'm sorry, sir. Could you repeat that? I think I get the drift, but I'm not quite sure. The fact that there are no sketches, photographs, or measurements, it actually hinders you from having a clear picture of the situation involving the external examination of the girls because the details of where things were and how things looked were not given by sketches, measurements, or photographs. That's correct, or were adequately 
adequately that would be, could be partially offset if the actual description, the written description, the text description of Dr. Bizarre and Dr. Baker was more detailed. Yes. But it wasn't. If they had said, for example, that there was a small round hole measuring one inch in diameter over the right eyebrow, that would have given me a little bit more clarification. All right, I understand. Doctor, do you know whether or not the girls were found clothed or unclothed? No, I don't. Do you know whether the girls were examined clothed or unclothed in the hospital examination room? No, I don't. No, I don't. Would you agree with me, Dr. Stevens, that a sexual assault can occur and then and there not be any bruising or penetration of the hymen area? Yes, I would. All right. And doctor, if you had photographs, sketches, or measurements, would you be able to offer an opinion as to whether the person who did this might be right-handed or left-handed? or any other specific details about the attacker might be clearer because of those types of items being provided to you? It's possible, but it's not as easy as people think it is, and sometimes it depends on an element of luck. All right. Doctor, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, just one more. Do any of the questions regarding the hymen, the bruising, etc., change your opinion today based on what you have seen and the accounts of this that you have read change your opinion that there was an absence of sexual assault? No, nothing. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Solic thank you. Solicitor, it's my understanding that you have a witness that you would like to call out of order because they are unavailable tomorrow, and you're certainly free to do that with the defense's consent. I appreciate the defense allowing this. Mr. Paul Fan, please. Come on forward, Mr. Fan, to be sworn, sir. Right here. Thank you, Mr. Bible, you're right. Mr. Fan, you're right. Mr. Fan, you're right. Back up. Thank you, Mr. Fan. 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 Okay, that's all right. Please state your full name and spell your last name <coughs> for the record. My name is Paul Fan. I spell it F A N N. Mr. Fan, can I get you something to drink? Would you like some water? No, sir. Well, a little bit wouldn't hurt. It's getting dry. Tell us where you live, Mr. Fan. I live in Hartsville, South Carolina. How long have you lived there? Uh, this is my second term around. I moved there in 1960. I moved away in 1970, and I moved back in 1983, and I guess I'm here for the long haul. All right. Are you, uh, by, by profession, what do you do? Uh, I've been in marketing and managed marketing and sales management for a great part of my life. And did you complete high school? Uh, yes, sir. Where? In Manning, South Carolina. All right. And where were you born? Uh, to be truthful with you, I was born at home at two miles out from Alcala. All right. And your family uh, was in the retail grocery business, I believe. Yes, sir. All right. And what was the name of the, the company? P.A. Fan Grocers. All right. And, and that was your dad's business? That was my dad's business. All right. What year were you born? I was born in 1935, in All May right. of 1935. So in 1945, you would have been about 10 years old? Yes, sir. All right. And do you have a, a, a clear recollection of your ninth year, your 10th year of living in the Appaloo area? I have a clear recollection of a lot of things, but for some things, let's face it, it fades. I understand. Uh, did you, when you were nine or 10 years old, did you work for your father's business? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, during those times, people didn't have uh, refrigerators and freezers as we have today. And we used to have a pickup truck and we delivered ice All right. throughout the community of Alcala. Did you deliver ice to black families as well as white families? We delivered ice to black 
families as well as white families, we had no division in that respect. Right. I'm thankful my father taught me we're all created equal. Right. Do you have been in the courtroom most of the day? I'm sorry? You have been in the courtroom most of the day? Since 2 o'clock. All right. Do you recognize the ladies who testified from the Stinney families as people you may have known back then? To be truthful with you, I could not hear her. That's why they gave me a hearing aid later. I did not catch her name. All right. Uh, were you familiar with the Stinney family? Uh, not really. All right. Uh, you don't I know, know where they, I knew where they lived. All right. And, and where did they live? Uh, right off of Alca, uh, Hotel Street in Alcalu, right behind the, the, at that time, the black elementary school. All right. And uh, uh, not, not directly behind, but within probably 100 yards or less. All right. Now, did you know a young man by the name of George Stinney in 1944? I did not know him personally. All right. And of course, I think there's already been testimony that the black kids and the white kids did not go to school together. Yes, sir. It wasn't our fault. All right. Uh, um, let me ask you this. Do you have a recollection of the events that occurred when the two little girls went missing and the community was out searching for them? Yes, sir. All right. And for example, as a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old, would you have been out on the search party? We were all out looking. I can't remember all of the phases. As I remember, they divided people up into groups and covered the area and scoured the area. All right. Now, do you remember a I time? Was one of those, I was part of one of those groups. All right. Do you remember a time where there was a, uh, a gathering of people outside the Stinney home and you were there witnessing what was going on at the Stinney home? Yes, sir. Exactly what time it was, where, I can't remember all that, but I can remember there was a, a crowd of people all surrounding, surrounding the home. All right. And, and was this home in Alcalou, South Carolina? It was in Alcalou. It was right. right back. Who were you there with? Uh, my father was there, but I was there, but it was a lot of other people there, too. Probably, uh, you know, when you're young, a small crowd of people is like a big crowd. So I would say it's probably 50 to 100 people at least. All right. And was it daytime or nighttime when you it were there? It was in the daytime. All right. Uh, can you give us an idea of what you saw with your own eyes that afternoon when you were at the Stinney home? As you know, that's been 70 years ago. Yes, sir. And so you remember highlights. But the highlights that I remember is when some guy came out of the house, whether it was the front yard or the front or the back, I don't remember that, but he came out of the house and say with a with a big ball of clothes in his hands and said said we found the clothes that he had on. Oh, okay. Did you say that he said something? Okay. Would you describe sustained it's hearsay right. obviously. Mine's not hearsay. Mr. Fan. Okay. Mr. Fan, you can't say what you heard somebody else say. You can only say what you saw. Well, I'll, okay. First of all, let me ask another question that we can probably handle it. Okay. The man that you saw come out of the house, was he black or white? He was white. Was he in uniform of some kind? I don't remember. All right. And you say in his arms there were certain items? He had an arm full of clothes. All right. Could you tell anything particular about the clothes? Were they men's clothes, women's clothes? I, I cannot answer. All right. And, and as he came out of the house, can you tell us what he did with the clothes? He, he went out and put them in a car. What kind of car? A police car. All right. Assumably. I, I, if I said yes or no, I'd be guessing. Right. I'm not going to do Some that. type of car? He put a car. He was either a policeman or he was attached to the police people. All right. After that occurred, did you actually see anything else at the Stinney house that day? And I, I can't remember either before or just after, but in that similar type, I remember that they came out with the young man. Had you ever seen the young man before? I was not familiar with him. All right. And the young man you believe to be George Stinney? Yes, sir. What did they do with George Stinney when they brought him out? They put it, kept, took him out and put him in the car. Was it the same car that the clothes had been put in? 
or a different call, if you remember. I can't remember. All right. Uh, after the police drove off, the cars drove off, did, did you stay around any, or were you? Uh, we went home. All right. Do you, do you remember anything about the trial of Mr. Stinney that, that occurred later on? I didn't go to the trial. All right. Now, we, we've discussed that you would have been about 10 years old. You were in school? Yes, sir. Right. Um, John? For the record, we have been given a map of Alkaloo, South Carolina that was dated July 31st, 1939, and it has a marking on it that says that it was revised in January of 1941. And we'd like to use this as an exhibit for some of the identification of some of the areas in Alkaloo in 1944 when Mr. Fan lived there. It's subject to our objection. I don't know if we've seen this. Mr. Map. We have seen the map, Your Honor, but we have some questions about the um, exactly, and, and this may be able to be covered by Mr. Sand in regards to his testimony about some things that are missing on the map. Okay. okay well, so the subject to right are. Um, yes. We'll go ahead and let him, you can ask his questions and we'll go ahead and. All right. Thank you. Let's put it right over there by to the judgment seat. Your Honor, may we stand and look at this? Yeah. What'd she say? Mr. Fan, stand up, please, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Fan, have you seen this map before? Yes, sir. And it was in my office. We talked about it? Last Friday. All right, sir. And does it purport to say on the map that it was actually revised in January of 1941? Yes, sir. All right. <coughs> this is a detailed map, an overview of Alkalu, South Carolina. Does it look familiar to you, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Some parts were a little changed, but for all practical purposes, as you and I agreed. All right, sir. Now, I believe on this side of the map, you will see a note that says that the U.S. Highway 521 yes, sir. is running down the left side of this map. Right. Where was your father's store located? It would be located about along here because this is an extension of 521 towards Manning. Yes, sir. Right here is where it crosses the railroad. This is where it goes towards Trinity Church. Uh, uh, right across here is where uh, George Jones' grocery store was. Uh, this is the road right here that goes out into the country. Uh, it's called the, Sp the Spigner Farm Road. And is it marked Spikner Farm Road yes, on sir. this? Right there. All right, sir. Now, uh, this area in here in the map, in the center of the map, is would this be the Alderman Lumber Mill area? Yes, sir. All right, and there's something on the map that says it's a log pond. That says the log pond. I can't remember whether that was here when I was there or not. All right. I, I, that part, because I didn't work for the Alderman Lumber Company, I think is what it was called. Uh, I, did, I was not privileged of going back in here unless you were an employee. All right. So for this, that reason, I wouldn't. This that. map says that Hotel Street. That's Hotel Street. Right dead here's ended. Where, right here is where the baseball field used to be. All right. Right here is where the Alcala Baptist Church is. All right, sir. Right here. And and Hotel Street dead end dead into, into 521. Yes, sir. Uh, going away from. 521 on Hotel Street. This right here is the railroad. Yes, sir. This is the first road that goes back, and it goes back into, uh, I'm going to use lack of any other words, subdivision or quarters, as they used to call it. All right, sir. All back up in here where there's multitudes of houses. All right, sir. And did you uh, service those houses with ice? We sure did. All right. Even all the houses along the front of the of here. All right, sir. We did delivered... We delivered ice to a lot of people. All right, sir. Might even some of the people may be still here right here today. All right. Uh, I, I was little, but I could pick up a 50-pound block of ice and walk with it. All right, very good. Did I've you happen? Weaker in the years. Did you happen to know the the Binnaker family or the Timms family? Uh, the Timms family right here lived right here. And can, can you tell the judge what number is on that house? I can't read it. Thirty. 
Is that 35? 35. Right in the corner. That would be the Tim's house or the Bennett house? That would be the Tim's house. The Tim's house. And where the was the Bennett? The family, I'm forgetting. <coughs> Did they live next door or right across the street from? All right. Could I ask one of the people that? No, no. You'd okay. have to just. Well, he was either right here or right next door. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. That's fine. Now, can you tell us the area of town that Green Hill Baptist Church? Yes, sir. There's two ways of getting there from here. Where is the Green Hill Church? It, it does not appear on this map. It's a little further. It's you, a little you, further. You'd have to say if you can recognize it from you the area. recognize it because the road comes up here and turn, comes out this way and comes around. The road that you're talking about, is it a dirt road? It's a dirt road. All right. To your knowledge, did it have a name wait, on it? Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on just a moment. I'm going up too far away. It may be easier, Mr. Finney, if you allow Mr. Fan to give him a little space and walk around so he can really get up next right. to it and okay. look at it. I'm sorry, Mr. There you go. I'm old, but I'm still walking. Right. This is Hotel Street That's Hotel and Street. 521 here. Chemical house of some kind. Okay. Right. The, uh, the, the road where the Green Hill Church was, the Green Hill Church would be up in this area. That would be on the right side, the far right side That's of that map? Right. All right, sir. All right. The, the, uh, this road comes on out, and it, the, Robin, the Robinson farm was over on this side. All right, sir. Mrs. Robinson's the lady, is, she was here. She Mr. Fan, hold, hold that position right there. Let me show you another map. This is a Clarendon County highway map. It does not have a date on it. I think I was provided it by the defense. That's Hotel Street right there. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you saw a dirt road indicated on this map that would lead to the church. I'm trying to find it. It said, we don't know. It says we need church. Here's the road right here. There's the Green Hill Church. Right here. Yes, sir. Oh. Stay still. All right. Look at this. Want me to hold it? Look at that. Right here. Yes, sir. Right here off to the left is where the uh, incident took place. All right. Place. Let, let me do this. Uh, have you been able to pick the Green Hill Church yes, sir. on this map? Yes, sir. And on the smaller map, uh, would you be able to say that it is uh, where you indicated on the bigger map, on the yes. right side of the bigger map? I object. I object to that. Hold on. I object to that. Okay. Okay. 
and there's a different scale on those two maps. I understand that. What we're going to do is mark this second map for Thank identification you. purposes, and I think is the first map been identified as well? It, that one needs to be marked for ID purposes. It's not necessarily in evidence, nor is this one, but just for me to be able to locate what Mr. Fan is going to testify to. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rice. We're going to ask the Hold on. You can't talk. I haven't um, marked them because there's no docket number. Okay. So I just have the number. We're going to have to just do it, you know, A and B with a number. That's how we're going to have to do it. Okay. Yes. Um, Do you have a we have an Elmo. Very good. That was my next question. If you could sit down, sir. I'm going to ask you some questions on that screen okay. right there. Just hold that right there. We're going to put a map up here. We need you to look at it and point out. Oh, that's good. Point out. Okay. okay. Turn it the other way, please, so 521 is down and to the... Mr. Fan. All right, I'm going to use the point, Mr. Fan, and see if I can order you. If you can see right here, this. Where did I point it? This is 521. Do you see the pointer? This is 521. Okay. This is the right. railroad track. Yep. There this is, is Hotel there. Street running into 521 right here. If you were to leave 521 on Hotel Street and going back into that subdivision area. Where is the. Where is the the black school on the right, how far down is that? Can it you says right there where the pointer is school. No, that's not the. The black school was on the right on Hotel Street. Can I? Go down past. Actually, Ms. Chandler, you should be able to see wherever he's pointing to should come up on your screen just like it does mine. Well, this is zoom in on up on your screen. No. Let's zoom in on this area. We need this area right here zoomed in. How about that? Okay. Mr. Fan, this is okay, the railroad track. Okay, I got it. All right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fan, I tell you what. It's only like going to work. He's got to go. If you would like to step him around so he can actually point instead of you worrying him and guessing. Mr. Fan, if you'll just step around and off the main Come screen. Come with me, Mr. Fan. If you would point to, you should be able to look off the uh, screen in front of you to be able to point. Okay. Mr. Fan? Yes, sir. You're going to have to point right here, but oh. it shows up on the map. All when right. You point. Okay. I'm getting there. Okay. This is the... Look at the map so you can see it better, I think. I got it right here. All right, good. Right here is Green Hill Church. All right. And th this road of question that we're talking about, the dirt road, you go right through here because when I deliver, when I used to deliver papers, I, that was the way I went through to get over to Hotel Street. All right. So when I get, just before you get to Green Hill Church, there was a ditch that went to my left, looking at the motor, right down there. All right. Sir. And that was a point of interest of where the incident happened. All right. And how do you know that that's the point of interest? As because far as I the remember ditch? it. All I, right. But they wouldn't let people, us, especially us young fellows, they wouldn't let us down there. So we stood on the on the on this dirt road and looked over the fence. And why do I remember it so deeply? I can still raise, roll up my arm sleeves, because when I was riding through there one day, I fell on. The, in the sandbog, 
and fell on a, a barbed wire fence and stuck a hole in my arm and it's still there. All right. <laughs> what did you observe in that field across from Green Hill Church? Uh, crowds of people and they were getting the bodies out of the... The bodies of who? Of two girls. All right. And the, those, the ditch. are those the two same two girls that we're here talking about today that were connected to the boy, George Stenning? Yes, sir. All right. And which came first? Did you see them taking the bodies out of the field first, or were you at George Stenning's house first? We were here. We were taking the bodies out of the, out of the field. You, you weren't doing it? No, sir. Who was doing it? Men. Men? Can't answer. Okay. Do you know what the bodies were on? I can't remember. I remember they took them out on cots, but other than that, I can't. I remember seeing the cots. We were not even close to the situation. All right. They wouldn't let us get close. Can you tell the judge how much time went by from the time you saw the cots being carried out of the field to the time you saw the the uh, black the cars at George Stinney's house? No, sir. There's 70 years passed since then. Okay. Very good. Can you tell me this? From where you have the Green Hill Church, where did George Stenney live? Uh, if you follow this road on through, you don't, uh, you don't go all the way. That actually, this road right here came into the edge of the quarters, quote yes, unquote, sir. and he lived right off to the left, just left of that road. All right, before you got to the paved road, Hotel but, Street? Oh, yes. To at the least, left? At least a couple of hundred yards. To the left? Yards, uh, to the left. All right. How far would it have been for George Stenney from where his house was to walk to Green Hill Church? I live in, this, in the towns now, say half a block. Half a block. And, and how far was it from Green Hill Church to the field where you saw the bodies being carried out? Probably a full block. A full block. Very good. Okay. Mr. Fan? It was, it was before you get to the, the, the this what was happening there was just on this side of the church, and where he lived was down this road right here, and then off to the left right there in that little community. All right. For the judge's information, does Green Hill Church still exist? Is it still there? I haven't been there in years, so I can't answer, but right. I think it is. All right. To your recollection, did Green Hill Church face the dirt road that you're talking about, that you yes, were traveling? It was up on a hill. The church was up on a hill? Uh huh. But did the church face the road? It faced, it faced that curve right there. All right. It uh, faced the curve. Uh -huh. All right, very good. Uh, was when you were coming <coughs> up this, coming from the community this way, you were looking at the church. All right, up on the hill. I remember it. I probably have, it's probably been 30 or 40 years since I've been through there. All right. So you can ask a question that I had to dig deep on. Very good. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to go back to the seat. You may have to answer some questions from these other lawyers. All right. Thank sir. you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon to you. Where is Archdale? Where is it that you live exactly in the state? In Hartsville. Hart you live in, I'm sorry. H-A-R-T-S-V-I-L-L-E. In Darlington County, where I'm, I'm from. That's so right. What part of Darlington County you live? You live, you live outside of Hartsville or in I live behind the 13th Green at Hartsville Country Club. Good for you. I don't know. I don't get to play with you. My wife died four and a half years ago, and I gave, out, gave up the ghost. I play about three times a year. I used to play three or four times a week. You know, that's, you know, I wish I had her she job. was a club champion three times. Was she? Not me, she. Was she? I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. 
you delivered ice when you were nine years old? Yes, sir. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't deliver the ice. I helped get it off the truck where we had to pick it, cut it in. You, you buy ice from the from the Manning ice plant. It came in 300 pound brackets, three 100 pound pieces put together, frozen. And uh, after we put it on the back of the truck, somebody decided, do you want 100 pounds, or 50 pounds, or 25 pounds? And you had ice picks and you cut it that size, you grab it with the tongs and away we go. But you learn to know who buys 25 pounds and who buys 50 pounds and who will take 100. Very few people could afford 100 pounds back then. Yes, sir. I'm not going to ask you what time it is. Would you, would you help me with a question just in, and answer just as briefly as you can? Yes, sir. Uh, and if you need to explain, I'll be delighted to give you time to explain. Thank you, sir. Right? You were about nine years old in 1944. Uh, well, I was, I was born in 1935 in May, and this happened in 44. Yes, sir. I'd be nine, I'd be nine years old. Yes, sir. And you helped your daddy. Uh, yes, sir. I worked for my dad, yeah. but so, I didn't drive the truck. Yes, sir. And so where you went, you went with your daddy. No, sir. He stayed at home. He ran the trucks, the grocery store, but he had people that worked for him. Okay. And so um, how far away did you live from the Green Hill Baptist Church? Less than a mile. I don't think it's a mile. How did you get there? How did I get that? On my bicycle. Okay. You rode your bicycle? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you say that around the Stinney house that day when you were there were almost 100 people? Hey, back then, 10 people looked like 50, you know? I don't know. I, I, all I knew, there was a crowd of people. Big crowd of people. In my mind, in my eyes. White people. Uh, I can't remember that part. I don't. I didn't count to see how many whites and how many blacks. You remember blacks? I'm, I'm sure there was some there. You sure? Do you remember? In my mind, I, I, I'm thankful my father did not divide. We, he think? taught everybody alike and taught us to do the same thing. So, 70 years ago, if I lived at a certain place and went to church every Sunday, and I walked. Would you not think that I would under I would be a good judge of how far I lived from that church? <laughs> that is not the church I went to. Sir? That's not the church that I went to. No, sir. I'm talking about if Mrs. if the Stinney children walk from their house every Sunday to the church, the Green Hill Church, and they walk back, they would probably give you a good estimate of how far it was from one place to the other. Don't you think? Uh, back in those days, I'd say no. But better than your 70 some year past memory. Uh, today, I could still remember, yes. Because I, but I didn't go to church there. But I knew where it was. I passed by where it was many a time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you told us everything you can remember? Yes, sir. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, I would ask that the witness be excused. He's got business appointments tomorrow. Any objection from the defense? No objection, Your Honor. Mr. Fan, you, you are excused. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Can I see the attorneys for a minute?
Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to go ahead and conclude for the evening. We are going to begin at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning with further testimony. I expect the attorneys here at about 9.15 or 9 o'clock uh, to identify some exhibits and put some agreements on the record. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate it. I want to thank you all. Good night. And uh, we look forward to starting promptly tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Um, yeah, sure. Right here. Forgive me for continuing to stay.